Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your word, a word of grace, a word in season. Please look on me in the words I speak and on all our hearts as we listen for your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. Anything to do with Philippi thrills my heart. Uh, Converted or at least uh, nurtured after conversion, In my first year as a student, 1970 to 71, an older brother sat me down and once a week met with me in what we now call a one-to-one to read Paul's letter to the Philippians. And ever since, it's been a complete favorite. I'm not sure you're allowed favorites in the Bible because it's all inspired, all the word of God, but unashamedly, it's my favorite. And verse six in chapter one, he who began a good work in you, in me it was in the year, the summer of 1970, and I go to university, uh, well, uh, 69 to 70, and then university 70, 71. He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion in the day of Christ Jesus. A work of grace begun, continued, and here I am 50 plus years later, and God is still good, still gracious, still sustaining me in my own Christian life and ministry. And Philippians, and anything to do with Philippians about this chapter, of course, introduces us to when the gospel came to Philippi, first of all, is a joy to my heart. Uh, I thank you, uh, thank Francis for inviting me to come uh, so that he can go and celebrate with his mum her 90th birthday, completely off the Bible scale, but a fantastic milestone. Windsor, do I hear it's in Windsor? Somewhere like that. Uh, and he said, you can preach on anything you like, which is, which is kind, but not a good thing for visiting preachers. Except he did say, oh, well, anything from the lectionary. So I looked there and saw Acts 16 was there. Uh, I've asked for a few more verses than were in the lectionary to be read. But here we are. Acts 16 is a fabulous chapter. Because it's one-off, we need just a little bit of background. Acts is the story of the Acts of the Apostles, probably more likely, the, more realistically, the Acts of the Holy Spirit, as the Gospel begins to go out into Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, and to all the ends of the earth, the promise given by the ascended Lord Jesus Christ. That... Uh, occasion that we have just celebrated in the church, always forever associated with the Great Commission to take the gospel into all the world and make disciples of all nations. Well, Acts tells the story of how that began. And we've got beyond Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria already, and we see how unstoppable the gospel is. It, it, it runs forward like water runs downhill. Yes, it may meet obstacles, but it'll still run by a different channel, a different course, even if not straight. It'll always run, it is unstoppable. And by the time you get to chapter 15, the way is open for the Gentiles. And I guess most of us here are Gentiles and are deeply grateful for this development. The gospel is open for Gentiles. This is really the end of Peter's mission and ministry in the New Testament until we get his letters in his old life, because he said he had realized that the Gentiles come to faith exactly in the same way as Jews, by grace. The grace of God alone. You can read it in Acts 15, 11, and that's Peter's final contribution to the story of the New Testament, apart from his letters and teaching. Uh, he hands over to Paul, and by this stage, end of chapter 15, on into chapter 16, the first missionary journey has begun as Paul pushes out Uh, from Jerusalem to Antioch, uh, and from that Gentile, essentially Gentile church, he and Barnabas are sent out. Well, now it's going to be Paul and Silas on their second journey that begins at the end of chapter 15, and 16 is the first really big chapter of it all. Why do they go? Well, we have to pick it up in chapter 15 and verse 36, where Paul and Barnabas say, Let us go back and visit the brothers in all the towns where we preach the word of the Lord and see how they're doing. 
and verse 41, he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. They believe in the need and value of follow-up. It's not enough for people to be converts. They must grow into disciples, mature, fruitful disciples. Now, we've learned that in uh, recent years all over again in the Christian church, even in the Church of England, that discipleship is what matters, not just conversions, not just numbers in church, but disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, mature and fruitful. Uh, an alpha course needs a beta course. Christianity explored needs discipleship explored. And that's what we see here. It's Paul's priority. He says in Colossians 1.28 that he seeks to proclaim Christ and make every person mature in Christ. Uh, St. Peter's has adopted that verse for its ministry amongst older people. A lot of older people think, well, I'm a Christian, that's it. No, that's not what the Bible says. It says we're to go on growing. Peter in his letter, look at the end of 2 Peter, the very last word from Peter in the scriptures, he says, but grow in the grace and understanding of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's as much a word to older people as it is to younger people. So Colossians, uh, Colossians 1.20, it's a great motto. It's certainly something that Peter will pick up and certainly something that Paul believes in. And for good measure, let me chuck in the writer to the Hebrews. One of the most stinging verses, Hebrews 5, comes in 11 to 14, where he's just made a magnificent point about Melchizedek from the Old Testament. So you see, Jesus is a high priest like Melchizedek. And it obviously goes down like a lead balloon because nobody has a clue what he's meaning and why it's important. And so he says, huh, how long have you been Christians? Do I have to teach you like babies all over again, teach you milk and the elementary? And he gives them a real roasting. Uh, he says, you should be mature believers now. You should, in fact, some of you should be teachers of others. But I'm having to treat you like infants in the faith. Oh, it's a very uncomfortable set of verses for anybody who's been a Christian for any length of time because it ends up saying, am I a teacher? Who am I teaching? Who am I nurturing? Who am I discipling? Not just responsible myself, but responsible for others. After all, I'm no longer wet behind the ears. Very important for a minister like myself to discover when you retire, you don't retire from being a member of a local church. And then you have to start doing the things or deciding to do the things that you as a minister have been encouraging, teaching, challenging people to do all your life. And you have to decide, do I go to church once on a Sunday or twice? Do I read my Bible at all from between Sundays? Uh, what's my commitment to prayer and the prayer meeting or to giving? I mean, these are routine, basic disciplines of the Christian faith. I suddenly realize I have to decide them for myself. I don't do them automatically anymore. You learn to be a member of a local church. And hopefully active, cheerful, mature, fruitful, useful. That's what I said to Paul Williams when I went to Christchurch Forward. How can I be useful? Help me to know how I can be useful as a member in this church. Paul knew the need and value of follow-up to turn converts into disciples, to see that they were going on with the Lord and growing in faith, being encouraged. And that brings us into the next bit of this second missionary journey. Paul sets out over land, but, uh, and he comes to Derby, Lystra, or Lystra, we don't quite know how it's pronounced, uh, and there he meets Timothy. Now, after Peter and Paul uh, and Jesus, Timothy is probably the most known about believer in the New Testament. Because we pick him up here almost certainly in his teenage years. He's probably about 18 if you put all the pieces together later on. In fact, he met Paul almost certainly when Paul first came to Lystra in the first journey in Acts 14, when he was probably only about 16. 
And what did he, he, he must have heard the message in this small town because there was a bit of a riot and Paul was left for dead, do you remember? Picked himself up and on he went. And young Timothy would have seen that. That's the cost of proclaiming the gospel, potentially. Anyway, now, two years later, he's met by Paul as a disciple. He's got a Jewish mum, we're told, but a Greek dad. Probably that's the reason he was not circumcised, because in the Jewish tradition, faith passes down the female side. But he, he hadn't been come, uh, circumcised. But Paul, we read, has him circumcised. But wasn't that the whole debate over the inclusion of the Gentiles? Did they or did they not? And they decided you do not have to be circumcised, follow that Jewish ceremony to become a Christian. But Paul has Timothy circumcised. We have here an example of Paul being quite firm about the gospel content, but flexible as to context about the means of getting it out. Paul does not do this to enable Timothy to be or become a Christian. You become a Christian by grace, God's grace, and our repentance for sin and faith in the Lord Jesus. We see that twice in this chapter. But he had him circumcised to enable the gospel to go forward the more effectively in that context. My great friend Lance Pearson has just died. But he wrote the first, what he calls, biography of Timothy for a thousand years. It's out of print now. In the Steps of Timothy, The Effectiveness of an Ordinary Christian. But it is one of the most remarkable Christian books I have ever read. It reads a bit like a, a, a detective novel, a bit like a play, a bit like a commentary. Uh, 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 it's just a fantastic book. Google it and see if you can get hold of it secondhand. But he charts through this character of whom we know a surprising amount from his earliest years as a teenager all the way through to his young adulthood and senior leadership in the church. And he shows uh, how a, a, a Christian grows through life, through teaching, uh, through service. That's what we see here. Timothy, who already knew how painful commitment to Christ could be, he'd seen it in Paul, now experiences it himself in a most personal and painful and sacrificial way. But he receives it uh, confidently and clearly. You see, we're, we're learning lessons about gospel, mission and service for ourselves who are still engaged, are we not, in the Great Commission. For Paul, he's got over the fact that Mark had let him down, the young man Mark, which is why he's not accompanied on this journey by Barnabas but by Silas, that comes at the end of 15. He hasn't lost his faith in young recruits because he picks up Timothy and recognizes something in him to join the apostolic band. He's like a ministry trainee. I don't know if you've had ministry trainees here. I think you probably have over the years, who are young people who are exploring gospel ministry for, for the future to see their aptitude and gifts and so on. It's a great principle. And here Paul uh, joins Timothy to the team, himself and Silas. And what do they do? They go on their way, encouraging the church. So you see in verse 5, the churches were strengthened in the faith. Do you notice that? Not in their faith, but in the faith. So there must have been a fair amount of teaching going on to build them up in this faith that they had received and they were to pass on. We come to what I think the most exciting bit of the chapter of all because we see it if you can follow on the map at all where Paul has come, he's come from Syria straight through the centre of Turkey and ends up on the coast of what's modern Turkey, just short of that, um, of the, what's it called, the isthmus that goes through eventually to the Black Sea. 
where, where Istanbul is. He's landed just south of that at Troas. It's very close to the ancient site of Troy and the Trojan War. But we see it now as the gospel crossing from Asia to Europe. And we know something about the extraordinary history of the gospel as Europe became the first Christian continent, it became the heart of the Christian world, from which 250 years ago, the great missionary movement finally went, with a little bit of help from America, but went all over the world. So Christianity became truly a global faith. And here we see the beginning of it, crossing over from Asia to Europe. It's a very special moment, one for which uh, if it doesn't seem too odd, we should be thankful. What if the Holy Spirit had allowed Paul to go southwest or to go north to Bithynia? As we read, actually the Spirit said, no, don't go. We don't know how. I wish we, I wish we did, but we're not told. For some reason, he was on his journey and he got taken to the coast at Troas. And verse 10 has a, a dramatic verse. After Paul had seen the vision, the vision at night of the man of Macedonia saying, come over, please, and help us. We got ready. Oh, we. Because you spotted that, didn't you, as it was read. They becomes we. So the authors joined them. Luke has now joined them. The apostolic band is... Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke at this point. By the time we get to chapter 17, uh, verse 17 of this chapter, we or us becomes they again, so presumably he leaves. So Luke joins them. We got ready at once, leaving from Macedonia, that's northern Greece, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And you say that's a perfectly ordinary narrative verse. Why is it exciting? Well, I think it's exciting for those little things that I've begun to hint at. Luke comes into the scene. But it's the word concluding. Uh, shortly after I became a Christian, I was asked to lead the Christian Union, the CU at the university. And I was absolutely paralyzed. I'd only really got going as a Christian for a year. I couldn't possibly be ready for this responsibility. So I poured it all out to this older brother reading Philippians with me. And he gave me a little booklet based on the language of the authorised version, the King James Version, called Assuredly Gathering, which is almost meaningless in today's English. But it is the authorised version of this word, concluding. We got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, assuredly gathering that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, what's been going on? Paul has had this vision. I've been to Troas. I'm an ancient historian and classicist by uh, university studies. And I wanted to go there to see the site of the Trojan War. It's just a bit inland from this. On the coast, it's a most atmospheric place. The old harbour has crumbled into the sea. You can sort of see it under the blue Mediterranean water. You look out to the island of Tenedos, behind which the ancient Greeks hid their fleet when they had left the Trojan horse and the Trojans bought it, and that was their downfall, as you know the story. But the, the Greek fleet was hidden behind the island of Tenedos. It's there, just a mile off, off the coast. There are two hills, and through the gap, the, the time we arrived, the sun set in the west. Oh, what, a, what an evening walk that was, to see the sun set between the hills of Tenedos. And of course, you're looking absolutely west at that point, as Paul must have done when he arrived. And you think, gosh, it's a new continent over there. Never been there before. Just across the sea there, and a little bit up to the north, is Macedonia. It's impossible not to have been thinking that if you ever saw the sun, if you, even today if you see the sunset, ah, what's over there? That was the background to Paul's vision. The man in the dream saying, come and help us. So what does Paul do? He says, he either dismisses it, does he? Or does he just decide? No, he gets together at the breakfast table. 
joined by Silas, he's got Timothy with him, and Luke pitches up. Now, had he met Luke at Troas? I don't know. Or whatever, but Luke is a doctor and Paul's about to make a sea journey. Maybe that's all part of why he's there. And the four of them at the breakfast table, Paul tells this amazing vision. And I guess he's saying, what are we to make of it? And they have a good old discussion. You know, we're only here because the Spirit of God has stopped us going here and he's stopped us going there. We've ended up here. It's dead end. It's the coast. Where do we go now? So maybe this is God calling us. He's been negatively guiding us. And now is this his positive opening a door? And they're discussing it, knocking it backwards and forward. This is an amazing illustration of guidance, God's guidance to his people in the work of mission. They're looking to God for what is his leading, and they're looking for the open door. Uh, Later in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, uh, on a later occasion he arrives at Troas, that God's given him an open door for the gospel. That's what they're looking for. Where's the open door? Because God is in the business of opening doors for the gospel. Oh yes, Revelation says he closes doors. We have to accept that too, as Paul and Silas and Co. had seen. But he opens doors for the gospel. And he wants us to see them, to discern them. It's not some sort of spiritual high that we get guidance. There's a lot of using the mind, thinking about what's happened. How has God been prompting? How has he been checking us? What opportunity is he giving us? It's all tied up in this extraordinary word, assuredly gathering or concluding. Now, the alert Christian that wants to be mature and active is doing this all the time, from day to day, wanting to redeem the time for the sake of the gospel. So, off they go. But before we leave this extraordinary moment, I hope that every individual is thinking like this, and every mission team is thinking like this, and every local church is thinking like this. What opportunities has God set before us for the mission of the gospel? Do we have plans? Do we have a map, a mission action plan? When we came into our new buildings at St. Peter's Harrow Wood, we were cock-a-hoop that we got through a mega building project. But somebody told us, don't forget that first year, lots of people will come. They will be interested in the building and the changes. But you'll never have more people through your doors in the community than you will in that year. So treat it as a year of mission, not as a year of gawping. And we did. And as we got to the end of it, a new associate minister on board kept us sharp and said, why one year? Should we not have a mission plan for five years? How will we prioritize in the work of the gospel? How do we read our situation? How do we read our community? And he just arrived, bold fellow, and he took three years number crunching and he told us, you're you're plateauing. You're not growing, you're plateauing. All right, you're holding your own, but you're plateauing. And you know what happens on a plateau? The only way to go, unless you do something about it, from your point of view, is down the hill. That's the danger of the plateau. So he went off and number crunched and thought and thought, and he came back to our PCC away day, just four months into his role, and he told us, we need to have an action plan, a five-year plan. And I'm so grateful under God that we had him at the right moment to help us to do that. Because it made us prioritize the gospel and start looking and discerning and concluding how God was leading us as a church. I don't think we'd have ever planted a church if we hadn't stopped and had that shake up from Jason saying, you're plateauing and you need to have a plan as to what you're doing about it. So let me encourage um, Fordham in that. Well, we conclude uh, with more of the narrative. He gets to uh, Philippi. Notice his strategy. He goes to a capital, big center of population in that region. It doesn't mean that's the only place he goes to, but that's where he starts, where people are, the capital. Uh, This was the city 
where Mark Antony had avenged the assassination of Julius Caesar. And the new emperor granted all the citizens of Philippi Roman citizenship, citizenship of Rome as a thank you for their support in that battle. To the Philippians, Paul wrote, our citizenship is, you can complete it for me, good Bible church like this, our citizenship is in heaven. You see? He knew his, his Philippi, didn't he? Well, it's that, it's a really big center. But he prioritizes the Sabbath when religious people gather. Too small to have a synagogue. You needed 10 Jewish men to have a synagogue. So all there was was a place of prayer. But that's where he goes. That's where he finds Lydia. And look at the wonderful dynamic of the gospel in verse 14. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. Here it is. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. This is how the gospel mission works. Paul speaks. That's needed. But the Lord opens the heart. That's needed, isn't it? You need both. So we speak as though it's all up to us. We pray knowing it's all up to God. Isn't that just a great simple dynamic of gospel work? We must speak. We need to be able to speak, willing to speak, knowing how to explain the gospel. That was the first thing that older brother did to me. Even before he started us reading Philippians, he made sure that I was a Christian, knew I was a Christian, why I was a Christian, and could explain it to other people. He gave me a little booklet called Journey into Life. And I remember rushing off to the first person I could and giving it to him. The most insensitive piece of personal evangelism in my life. But at least I did it. I'm, I ended up, the best thing I did was say, look, read this, it'll do you good, or something like that. Um, he did become a Christian eventually, so <laughs> praise God. But it was very insensitively done at the time. But it's a good principle, isn't it? Like a good joke. If you understand and enjoy a good joke, you're bound to pass it on. If you've discovered Jesus Christ for yourself and the joy of new life in him, you're bound to pass it on because you can't help it in one sense. Well, don't lose that joy. The jailer discovered it in the final story. But there's the dynamic. The Lord opens her heart as Paul speaks. And her response? Well, it's rather wonderful. As she's come to belong to God... She knows also that she's come to belong to God's people. So she receives baptism, which is the sign of belonging to God by his grace for the forgiveness of sins and for the gift of the Spirit, new life. We know that every time we have a baptism. She, belongs, uh, she belonged to God, but baptism is also the sign of belonging to God's people. You're welcomed into the community of faith. You belong to the family. I love saying to a little baby before they can know it, as well as to children and adults in baptism, all Christians are your brothers and sisters from now on. You're part of a wonderfully big family of God. And that's the language that this chapter begins with, verse 2. The brothers at Lystra, and it's the, the word used at the end. Now with this fledgling little church in Philippi, the brothers... They met with the brothers. That's family language. That's the language of every Christian family at her best. And Lydia knew that she joined, however small. And how does it show that new life had come? Well, she understands and loves the fellowship. She opens her home for hospitality and for service. Immediately, she's pitched into service, a good sign of discipleship taking root. Well, that same pattern follows in the healing of the slave girl. It's not Paul's power, it's the power of the name of Jesus, but it is Paul's message. Same pattern. But here we're introduced to the opposition, severe and painful. Not least because as verse 21 says, it wasn't quite the reason, but they gave it advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. That's where most of the opposition comes from because the Christian gospel challenges the prevailing culture. 
the prevailing norms, the prevailing priorities, the prevailing interests. It always, always has done. That's the root of almost all Christian opposition to the Christian gospel. Well, let's be real about it. We have an enemy. Paul, as a result, gets chucked into prison. God intervenes again to set him free. He's still looking with the apostolic band to God. They're still singing praises and praying in the midst of terrible suffering. And God intervenes, yes, very dramatically. Notice Paul's presence of mind. He's not panicking. He's still looking for opportunities. That's what saves the jailer's life from suicide. It's what keeps all the prisoners in place. And the jailer, well, what's behind his phrase? What must I do to be saved? Looks too good to be true. But that was exactly the message that even the spirit who'd captured the slave girl The Spirit knew that. They're teaching a way for people to be saved. The message was all over town. That there's a new way of salvation. So maybe that's behind what the jailer's asking. And he gets the classic reply. Well, turn to Jesus. Trust in him. Believe in the Lord Jesus. For forgiveness, for the gift of his Spirit, for a whole new life. And it happens wonderfully. And notice again, he's baptized, that sign of belonging to God and belonging to his people, his church. Notice it ushers immediately in service, care, food, hospitality, and this wonderful joy. A a kaleidoscope of people are encountered by the gospel. As Paul will say in Galatians 3, Neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. All one in Christ. And what we've just looked at by way of narrative, there have been Jews and Gentiles. There have been slave and free. There have been men and women reached and saved by the gospel. And they form the new church, all one in Christ. A real hodgepodge of humanity but saved by the grace of God the grace of the gospel and brought into fellowship with the Lord and with one another well we've galloped through an extraordinary chapter I hope you've caught something of the adventure of it and the significance of it even for us who are still engaged in the Great Commission nowadays probably the greatest commission all of us are and can be involved in is the re-evangelization of Europe. And it'll begin with our own nation. That's the focus of Crosslink's mission at the moment, or in recent years, if you're a supporter of Crosslink's as a mission partner, is the re-evangelization of this country and Europe. Some of the hardest territory now for the gospel. So be encouraged by the mission of the the gospel. It's God's priority, God's mission, and the gospel is unstoppable. It, It should be a priority for the church. The queen, when she opened the new general synod, told them, reminded them, what an extraordinary thing, that the monarch should remind the bishops and the members of the house of clergy and laity of the general synod of the church of England, the power of the church, this nation needs as a priority it needs the knowledge of God it it needs to know God and she was sort of telling them don't forget that's your purpose not to argue and debate your purpose wonderful Uh, and I hope you capture something of the adventure the adventure of faith whether it's for a Timothy or a Lydia or indeed for Paul and the apostolic band but the adventure of the gospel itself Ever since uh, John started reading from Philippians with me, that has captured my heart. The joy of belonging to the Lord and being caught up in his cause, the cause of the gospel. And every time you dip into to Acts, you get fired up again. Challenge, yes, but fired up with the joy, with the adventure of it.
Because that's what following Jesus is all about. It's an adventure of faith. That's all about the cause of the gospel. It's an adventure in mission. Let's pray, and then we're going to sing a song which perhaps hasn't been sung for a while, but is a heartfelt response to what we're hearing. Lord, thank you for the message of the gospel. And each one of us perhaps can think of those who first brought that gospel to us, whether it was our own family, whether it was indeed friends at school or university or later through a local church or mission. Thank you that your good news reached us and by your grace you turned our heart from idols to serve you, the living and true God. And we pray that in our day, in our place, you'd enable each one of us afresh to proclaim this gospel so that we may have the joy of seeing others added to our number and being strengthened in the faith in seeking to reach others also. All to the glory of Jesus. Amen.